Hello everyone, welcome to Zero's Ham Shack. This is the last episode I will be recording prior to taking the SB230 over to the ham desk over on that side of the room and powering it up and, and tuning it up to make sure that everything is adjusted <clears throat> the way I wanted it. In my last video, I, uh, I stated that I would adjust the, uh, the high voltage calibration. I did. I would adjust the, uh, the grid current calibration. I did as well as the plate current calibration. I did. Uh, I also made a couple of changes to the Pi network that uh, I found that I had to make in the first linear amplifier. I kind of just went ahead and did it this time, even though I'm, I'm not 100% certain that I need it. I'm going to say I'm 90% certain that it still need it, needs it. And that's a result of different, slight differences in the operating impedance of the new tube versus the original tube. So I did have to make some adjustments so that the, the calibration of the tuning controls was within range uh, as indicated on the front panel to the Pi network on the output coupling circuit. <clears throat> so you'll see that I've got our guest of honor over here turned on on the bench and still gettering. Uh, the, the tube had, was gettering all night long and uh, of course the, uh, the heat sink got a little bit warm as I expected it to do and uh, it did dribble out a little bit of thermal compound as I expected it to do as you can see here in this photograph. What I did not expect was that over the course of the morning as I, as I did all my calibration and whatnot that it would continue to dribble out. So I got a, I got a rag under it right now and hopefully it will stop soon. Um, <clears throat> we'll see. But uh, it's uh, squeezing out all the juice. <laughs> and well, yeah. So um, I'm going to do this as a series of still snapshots that I narrate. I think that'll be the easiest and best way to present this to you so that uh, you can easily recreate the steps that I'm about to present. Let's start with the tank circuit. So in this picture right here, you'll see that I have disconnected the wire from the rotary switch to the top terminal of the uh, Pi network coil. And in this photograph here, I have reattached it to the uh, heavy gauge coil, uh, highlighted with, or, or circled so that you can uh, see where it was reattached. That was necessary for the 10 and 15 meter band calibrations. In this picture here, you'll also notice that loop uh, that has a wire coming from it. That needs to be detached and that is for the uh, 20 and 40 meter uh, calibration and it's reattached one winding up the coil where you see it in this photograph. To calibrate the plate current, what is necessary is a, uh, an, an amp meter of your own. Uh, I find this uh, Dynascan Simpson clone um, analog meter to be very accurate compared to any digital uh, device that I own and uh, it, uh, it has, has the ranges that I need that my digital devices don't. So the two leads coming in from the right hand side are from a variable 12 volt power supply. It varies down to from 1.5 volts up to 14.5 volts. That <clears throat> feeds into an alligator clip that goes up to my resistance decade box. The resistance decade box comes back down out of that, uh, out of that uh, twisted pair to a black alligator clip that is clipped to the base of the chassis at the uh, plate current sensing resistor, which is a 1 ohm 5 watt resistor. The other side of that 1 ohm 5 watt resistor is connected in series to the meter and then the meter is connected back 
to the power supply. So please note the polarity. The red alligator clip is really supplying negative voltage to the uh, current sensing resistor. Here's a close-up of those of those two connections. Now the whole purpose of this setup is to inject 500 milliamps across the current sensing resistor so that I can get an indication on the panel meter and calibrate the the panel meter to match the analog Simpson meter or the Dynascan meter. So when I when I uh, attach it, the uh, the the resistor that I have selected in my resistance decade is 25 ohms, 20 watts. And I turn the voltage of the uh, variable power supply up to roughly 10 volts, and I end up with about 500 milliamps of current flowing through the current sensing resistor. That creates a voltage drop across the resistor. That voltage drop indicates at the panel meter on the front of the linear amplifier and is calibrated with the potentiometer for the, uh, for the plate current. So you put the, the uh, rotary switch into the plate mode, send your current through that resistor, it creates the voltage drop, calibrate the pot, done. The next calibration is to the, uh, to the grid circuit. So in this case, put the uh, rotary switch into the grid position Put your clip on the center wiper of the relay and inject 40 milliamps through that circuit to ground. Um, the clip on the right is from the power supply. The clip on the, on the, red, uh, on the red mini clip is coming from the resistance decade and the resistance that I have chosen for this is 250 ohms one watt. Again, I turn the variable supply up to uh, up to 40 milliamps current flowing through the circuit, as displayed on the Dynascan analog test meter, and then adjust the uh, the grid current pot on the linear amplifier to match the indication on the Dynascan meter. Lastly we want to calibrate the grid bias voltage for a quiescent current on the plate when keyed of about eh, 35 to 40 milliamps. Okay, that's about where I like to run it. So you start with the uh, bias board with its maximum voltage and its maximum voltage is like 37 volts or something like that, okay? Um, do not start with a minimum voltage because you will quickly toast it. So make sure that you are at the maximum voltage setting for the grid bias board before you start. And what you do is go to the, uh, the, the plate setting on the rotary switch. Make sure that the amplifier is fully warmed up. Key the transmitter with a, with a load on the output on the output connector or key, key the linear with a load on the output connector and slowly adjust down the voltage on the bias, on the grid bias board until you achieve a quiescent current uh, between 35 and 40 milliamps. That's about the sweet spot that I, that I found. Once you've done that, you're all done. My next step, of course, is to walk this over to the, uh, to the, to the uh, ham position and give it a go. It's go time. All right, so here I am at the operating position. As you can see, the SB230 has been, uh, has, has been placed in its new home next to the original homebrew linear amplifier that I made with a pair of 4CX250s. Um, I can't quite bring myself to take it off the desk just yet, but uh, the, uh, the SB230 is working very nicely um, on 40 through 10. So the good news is the amplifier is working. I wired it correctly. Uh, the, uh, the, the changes that I made to the tank circuit were correct. The bad news is 
I couldn't get it to tune up on 80 meters at anything more than 20% power. I would uh, load up the uh, load up the linear amplifier, just tune it with 10 watts in, and which, which produced maybe I don't know 100, um, 50 watts out, and I'd uh, put in uh, 20 to 25 watts, and that, that brought up the output power to about uh, 150 watts, and at that point the output power tanked. Just boom. The output power would drop and the plate current would spike. Thought I had a parasitic oscillation. Spent quite a bit of time trying to diagnose it. In the, in the long run, uh, if, you, if you look at this schematic diagram right here, you'll notice that there is a 100 picofarad capacitor that is engaged only in the 80 meter setting on the linear amplifier with the band switch in the 80 meter position. Here is a photograph of that capacitor taken out of the linear amplifier and that's how I was able to diagnose the problem by uh, trying to tune up the amplifier without that uh, shunt capacitor on the plate tuning capacitor in place. Uh, I had to tune the the Kenwood to 4.4 megahertz because without that capacitor it will not tune into the 80 meter range but uh, without it uh, I was able to to, uh, to uh, tune it at 4.4 megahertz into a dummy load not transmitting and uh, check to make sure that uh, that was my defective component. Upon further examination of the uh, capacitor noticing a hairline fracture in two places on the, on the capacitor I uh, gently broke it free and here's what I found. So this capacitor uh, was defective to begin with uh, and uh, what you'll see here is uh, a hole that was actually punched right through the dielectric and was continuing to arc anytime I tried to load up the amplifier above 150 watts or so. So it's temporarily in its home. I do have another capacitor on order. The dumb capacitor cost me almost as much as the, as the GI7B. I'm paying 30 bucks for this little capacitor that you can't get any place else. <laughs> so, um, it is what it is. When I get that capacitor in, I'll be able to tune 80 meters and, and life will be good. To uh, conclude this series, I will be posting a, uh, a full uh, array of photographs and, uh, and schematic diagrams and details and I will link the uh, location of those files in the description below so that you can download them and, and review them for yourself and go and, and walk through the whole procedure. I still recommend that you watch this whole series from start to finish because there's, there's a lot of important information in this video series that you're going to need in order to have a, a, a good time upgrading the SB230. But it is doable. Uh, if you have the courage and if you have the skills, go for it, man, because uh, it, it is so worth it. That's it for now. As always, please rate, share, comment, and subscribe to my videos. Hit that subscribe button. And peace, everyone.